Questions without notice. Senator Webber. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Scullion, the minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Is the minister aware of a report released yesterday that says the number of Australian households enduring mortgage stress will rise above 600,000 in coming months? Doesn't the Australian Mortgage Industry Report by Fujitsu and JP Morgan also find that 113,000 families may be forced to give up their homes because of mortgage stress? Doesn't the report cite rising interest rates as the main reason for mortgage stress and conclude that young families in the outer suburbs will be particularly hard hit? Don't these findings, which show that record numbers of families are losing their homes, reveal the impact of the government's broken promise to families that it would, and I quote, keep interest rates at record lows. Senator Scullion. <laughs> Mr President, uh, I particularly love getting a question from Labor on interest rates. Uh, they, don't, uh, they, they, they have absolutely no sense of irony. Uh, I, I, I remind, I remind, senators, I remind uh, senators once again that the highest interest rates have ever been under the coalition government uh, is still lower than the lowest point than it ever was uh, under the last Labor government. Now, what does the Australian Labor Party say to uh, people, Mr. President? What, is, what does the Australian Labor Party, uh, Mr. President, say to those people who struggled under 17 per cent interest rates? When they were in power, what does he say to the two million people, Mr. President? What does he say? What do they say to the two million people who are unemployed? And, and uh, to simply have, have that have that little—it's uh, uh, almost a trifecta. You know, you, you have interest rates uh, out of control. No, nobody has a job, and you have uh, exploding inflation, uh, Mr. President. But I know they're trying to make some sort of a comparison, but. Uh, but I, but I have to say that, uh, Mr. President, in terms of the last 11 years of government, we have been extremely effective with housing policy, Mr. President. We uh, had the first homeowners grant, Mr. President, uh, and perhaps I can share with this place an interesting anecdote I just had with a staffer uh, today, who's just finished purchasing her first home, her first home in the northern in uh, Australian Order. Capital Territory, Mr. President. She lives in the Australian Capital Territory, and she was delighted to receive. The seven thousand uh, dollars first homeowners grant. Delighted to see that. However, Mr. President, just a tad disappointed to be hit for the eleven thousand dollars in stamp duty by Mr. Order, Stanhope. Order, order, po order. Point of order, Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. My goes the question of relevance. While I enjoy Senator Scullion's uh, <laughs> reminiscences and anecdotes, normally I think Senator Weber asked a very serious question about the ABA report on the Australian mortgage industry. And I'd appreciate if you asked him to uh, respond to the question, the very serious question asked of him. Senator Evans, I can't direct the minister how to answer a question, but I can remind him of the question. Senator Scullion. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, it's, it's good to see they're paying, the, the leader of the opposition is paying attention, Mr. President. Uh, the substance of the question, uh, Mr. President, was in regard to interest rates. And that the report indicated that interest were rates were going up. So I stand in this place to remind the Australian people of what it must have been like to have 17 per cent interest rates rather than the 8.3 per cent 8 we have now, Mr President. I think that's a very reasonable consideration of the question that was provided. Uh, Mr President, as I was saying, over the last 11 years of this government, we've been extremely active on housing policy. We now have tax arrangements to encourage... Order! We have a new, we've already spoken in this place, Mr. President, of a new approach to boost the supply of public housing by getting the private sector involved. Uh, we've had tax arrangements to, in, to, encourage, to encourage the Labor state governments to do, start doing the right thing uh, in regard to cutting their housing tax. We have again, Mr. President, provided a strong economy, Mr. President, so that everybody who wants a job has one. Very hard to pay your, your mortgage off if you don't have a job, Mr. President. And again. 2,186,000 people today enjoy a job that they did in, in, uh, in 1996, Mr. President. Of course, there, there's the crux of it. If you have a job, you can actually have the joy of being able to buy your own home. 
Now, we're actually an experienced government. That we make policies that are well thought out, they're sensible and they're extremely well considered. We don't pretend we can solve problems by establishing another inquiry or having a committee. We're, we're actually having uh, we've got philosophies based on substance, uh, not on froth and bubble, uh, uh, Mr President. And of course, Order. We, our government is characterised by a leader who is prepared to make decisions, rather than those on the other side who unfortunately are led by a completely Order. weak and gutless leader, Order. Mr President. Order. Order. Senator Carr. Had you concluded your answer, Senator Scullion? Indeed, Mr. President. S supplementary order. Supplementary question, Senator Webber. Thank you, Mr. President. Hasn't the Howard government had 11 long years to do something about the housing affordability crisis? Why is it that after 11 years in office, the best this government can do is hold a brainstorming session in the party room to desperately try and discover a pre-election policy. Doesn't this highlight the fact that this stale, out-of-touch government has no idea about how to make it easier for young families to buy their home in the future? Senators. Order! Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm not sure about. Uh, I was actually in the party room. I wasn't sure about a brainstorming session. But as I've said in this place, if they were paying attention, Mr. President, we have made substantive investments in a new relationship with the private sector. The private sector can be trusted to deliver. And I can tell you this much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I know that if we invest uh, $10 billion over 10 years with the private sector, we won't be scrabbling around wondering why we had absolutely zero houses from Labor. Absolutely zero. I know the new and refreshed relationship is going to be with the private sector because we know that Australians deserve to have a better deal in terms of housing affordability. And that's exactly what this government are going to deliver because we have strong leadership and they have none. Order, order, set, order. 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 Senator Cormann. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Administration, Senator Minchin. Will the Minister inform the Senate of the importance of maintaining efficiency in government administration? Is the Minister aware of proposals to create a number of new bureaucracies and conduct reviews and inquiries? What are the implications of such proposals for the level of government spending? Senator Minchin. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Cormann for that question. Mr. President, it's indeed the fact that one of the most important principles in running the federal budget is to ensure that departmental running costs are kept at a minimum so that taxpayers' money is spent where it should be on the services we deliver to the Australian people. At the uh, last election, the Coalition promised to increase the annual efficiency dividend on government departments from 1 per cent to 1.25 per cent, and that measure, fully implemented, has saved taxpayers over $280 million in departmental running costs in the three years since the last election. Uh, by contrast, Mr President, and in response to Senator Cormann's question, I note that the Australian Labor Party has promised an explosion in government bureaucracy, with 67 new departments, agencies, committees and task forces, and another no less than 96 reviews and inquiries. Now, obviously, that is going to add enormously Order. to the cost of merely running the federal government, let alone the business of actually delivering programs and services. But, of course, the Labor Party hasn't told us how much this great Senator new Sherry. empire of theirs is actually Order. going to cost or how it would be paid for. And of course, as usual, Mr Rudd, we leave the detail to another day. But what's uh, even more audacious is that Labor frontbenchers keep telling us they've identified a great pool of savings you know, to pay for all this great new bureaucracy. Well, of course, in reality, the uh, claimed $3 billion savings over four years, that is less than $1 billion a year, which is their claim, um, at least $2 billion of that is either completely spurious or lacks any explanation as to how they'd achieve it 
or where it would come from. Um, but it's particularly laughable in the light of this expanding bureaucracy they propose. Um, they claim they would save money on consultancies, um, but they're setting up 96 new reviews and inquiries. Well, who on earth is going to conduct all these reviews? And if it's not the consultants, because they're going to save money on consultants, then I suppose they're going to be hiring additional full-time staff to perform it. And how will that much will that cost? They say they'll save money by abolishing work choices, but of course they don't mention they want to set up Fair Work Australia, a number of job protection authorities, an office of work and family, as well of course as conducting reviews into subjects ranging from the job network to work for the dull for artists. We're going to review that, Mr President. Labor has claimed a saving from cutting the budget of the Department of Foreign Affairs but doesn't say how they're going to pay for their new Canberra Commission, the new WTO Working Group, the African Australia Council, the Pacific Climate Change Centre, the Regional Disaster Management Coordination Authority, not to mention the cost of nine reviews of everything from AusAid to the Diplomatic Service to a review of our further integration with New Zealand, which we look forward to. Um, Mr President, the Labor savings don't add up because they don't understand that you can't reduce spending if you're going around expanding the size of government as they propose. But of course, despite the incoherence of that position, they do continue to cling to the notion that they're going to produce savings. Uh, he said that Mr Rudd said the cost of the new bureaucracy will be met from this mythical savings, but Wayne Swan has already said that those same savings, this new magic pudding of Labor's, is going to pay for their education promises. Lindsay Tanner says the same magic pudding will pay for their Labor skills and infrastructure commitments. Last night Nicola Roxon claimed on the 7.30 report that this same mythical magic pudding of savings is going to fund the $2 billion in new spending on health. They think if you can just assert these savings, then you can use the same pool of savings several times over to, can, to fund every conceivable election commitment, including a massive new bureaucracy. Mr President, you cannot run a trillion dollar economy or a $230 billion budget on this nonsensical approach to government. Order. Order. Your colleague is waiting to ask a question, Senator Evans. Order. Senator Macdonald. Senator Campbell. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Scullion, Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Is the Minister aware of data contained in the Housing Industry Association 2006 census showing that over half of all people renting in Hastings, Great Lakes, Coffs Harbour, Nambucca, Kempsey, Bellingen, Tweed and Barron Bay Shires are in rental stress? Doesn't it also show that over 40 per cent of people living in Auburn, Strathfield, Fairfield, Rockdale, Liverpool, Botany Bay, Holroyd, Cogra and Hurstville in Sydney are enduring mortgage stress. Can the Minister explain how this latest report fits with the Prime Minister's claim, and I quote, that working families in Australia have never been better off? Senator Scullion. Senator Scullion. Uh, Mr President, uh, Mr. President uh, I, I think we all accept in this place there is a clear link between uh, uh, the, the, uh, the cost of rent and housing affordability generally, and I know these sort of all fall within the same argument. But I think it is important in this place that uh, we actually deal with some facts in this matter. It's a, it's a surprise in the number of reports that do spring up, and I, and I think an important document. Is in, is in fact uh, our most recent census document, uh, uh, Mr. President. Now, the census actually shows that median weekly rents, as a proportion of median weekly household incomes, have remained stable at about 19 per cent since 1996. That's, a, that's just a, a fact. We should just leave with this. But, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't acknowledge that there are pockets. Uh, uh, of demographics around Australia that the good senator can point to that may be having fluctuations, and I'm not aware. I'm not sure if the senator is about is the particular reasons behind that. It, it may be because of a particular shift in some demographic or another. But I think it is really important to have a look at some of the issues that the Commonwealth government, in a generic sense, have afforded. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we provide uh, nearly 2.3 billion dollars. Uh, a year to ensure that people can enter the private rental market through our rental assistance program. This is an absolutely essential program, uh, 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 Mr. President, 
and it's an essential program that we are committed to, and it is the single biggest uh, budget item in terms uh, anywhere in Australia in terms of pe people uh, uh, providing uh, rental. But again, it all comes down to uh, um, uh, the situation where we have a, a whole range of issues that need to be considered at a state and a Commonwealth level. But houses and housing, uh, the cost of rent is tied very much to the cost of housing. Uh, and unless we are able to address what I think is an absolute uh, cynical approach uh, by the states and territories in terms of land release and uh, the provision and uh, the, in fact the expansion of, of, uh, of public housing. Uh, Mr President, uh, I was in uh, South Australia uh, on uh, last Friday uh, and I was actually in fact in the Eyre Peninsula. I was talking to a number of people who were talking to me about this very issue, about this very issue uh, Mr President. Uh, where, there is a, where there were a number of people who were saying, look, rent's just increasing, it's becoming very hard. So again, Senator, it isn't a demographic that, that, that you're speaking of. Uh, I made some further <laughs> inquiries that, that day and, and, I and I understood, uh, Mr President, that some reason known only unto themselves, the South Australian government are selling 150 of their own public housing stock. 150 houses are being sold by the South Australian government at a time where there is rental pressure on their own constituents. And I have to say, Mr President, I'm not sure if that's the circumstance that exists everywhere, uh, Mr President, but I suspect that if they need to if they need to if uh, Australians need to understand why the rents are going up in some particular area, I think mm -hmm. that the answer will be about uh, housing stocks and the availability of public housing. And I think uh, substantially uh, we can look either to the complete failure of the Labor governments around Australia to produce a single extra house at the cost of some $10 billion provided by the Commonwealth Government and have a look at the very cynical processes of actually providing money for the public coffers by selling off public housing. Supplementary question, Senator Campbell. Mr. President, I point out to the minister just in case he misunderstood my original question, that all of the places and areas I name are all in New South Wales. None of them are in South Australia. <laughs> but, uh, supplementary, Mr. President, doesn't the government on backbench know that the government has dropped the ball on housing affordability? Hasn't the hard government had 11 long years in office to help families who can't afford housing? Why is it, Minister, that after 11 years, the best a hard government can do is to get out the whiteboard in the party room and try and cobble together a desperate election, pre-election stunt? Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I think all of Australia needs to understand that what this government is in this matter is fair income. We have decided to pull apart the foolish relationship we have with Labor in the states and territories. We are going to stop saying, keep pouring money into the states and territories, hoping they will get fair income and actually provide a single house for Australians. They are not going to do that. We are fair income. We have engaged the private sector. We are going to be fair income about providing new houses for those people in Australia, particularly in those demographics that are suffering from rental increases. We are fair income, uh, Mr President, but I can tell you those on the other side don't have a clue. They are a policy-free zone on this matter and on almost every other matter you care to know, Mr President. We are a government that is characterised by strong leadership, not by an absolute leaderless mob on the other side. We are going to provide better and affordable housing in Australia in the future. Order. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Communications, Information, Information Technology and the Arts, Senator Coonan. As the Minister is aware, the delivery of broadband services is very important across Australia, especially in my home state of South Australia. Will the Minister please update the Senate on government action to ensure all Australians enjoy access to broadband. Further, is the minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Coonan. Good uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. And I do thank Senator Birmingham uh, for his question and recognise his ongoing commitment to the delivery of real broadband services for Australians. 
Mr. President, uh, the Howard government has taken the tough decisions required to deliver fast broadband to all Australians, not only in South Australia, but regardless of where they live. Delivering fast broadband to all sectors, to the universities, to research organisations, businesses, farms and householders, is a national priority. And despite the sideshows being run in some quarters, we are getting on with the job of delivering high-speed broadband for consumers. Our broadband rollout is real. It is fully costed. We know exactly where it will cover. It's affordable. The contracts are signed, and it will be available to 99 per cent of the population by July 2009. Now, Mr President, the last time I looked, Labor's so-called broadband alternative consisted of a six-month-old press release and nothing more. True it is that I've been calling on Labor to release essential detail about how, when, where and who would build Labor's network and what it will cost the hapless taxpayer. So imagine my excitement this morning, Mr President, when I heard Mr Rudd say that they have, and I quote, they have already indicated the design specifications for delivering their broadband plan. Labor, of course, have done no such thing. It's clear that either Mr Rudd is totally ignorant of what technical specifications are required, or he's hiding the fact that Labor has no policy detail to release. But this really shouldn't surprise anyone, Mr President. Labor is clueless when it comes to actually making a decision about or getting a job done. At last count, Mr President, uh, Labor had announced, as Senator Minchin uh, had said, no fewer than 67 new bureaucratic agencies and an astonishing 96 inquiries or reviews, that and 13 just, just in my portfolio alone. And yesterday, uh, Mr President, not to be outdone, although he came late to the game, not to be outdone by his colleagues, Senator Conroy announced yet another inquiry. Oh, no. Yet another oh, inquiry. No. This, is this time an inquiry into the internet and costs of broadband access. The problem with Labor's latest stunt, Mr President, is that the ACCC already does this <coughs> job. They've done it for years yeah, yeah. and they are expert at it. By announcing their own process, Labor has made it crystal clear that part of their deal with Telstra is to cut the ACCC out of the picture. Now, Mr President, this is a great, da a great uh, danger for consumers who, under the ACCC, have seen retail telecommunication prices fall by over 26 per cent. That's right. And I'll tell the Senate something else for free. I predict that Telstra will try to meddle in the upcoming election with one aim in mind to get Labor into power right. and then demand competitors be driven from the field. Explosive we all know that uh, yeah. Telstra's got uh, John Utting, Labor's pollster, on their payroll. So I say to Mr Trujillo and Mr Burgess and all the others who pass for Telstra executives, if you want to meddle in Australian politics, get it out in the open, stand for Labor pre-selection and actually bring it on. You just better stand for Australian citizenship first. Yeah, and while yeah. Mr Rudd and his weak Labor team dither order, with order, inquiries, paralysed by inaction, this government will get on with the job of delivering Australian consumers the services they need and want. Yeah. I remind senators on my left that one of your colleagues is waiting to ask a question. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Ellison, Minister representing the Minister for Immigration and Citizenship. Can the minister confirm reports that the 457 visas of two Chinese men have been cancelled despite, men, despite the men being owed more than 30,000 each in unpaid wages? If these two workers didn't have the required skills as immigration now claims, can the minister indicate how and why they were granted their visas in the first place? Can the minister also explain why the officials who cancelled the visa said, and I quote, I do not consider that the visa holder will be caused significant hardship by the cancellation of his visa, end of quote. Does the minister support this finding? If so, can the minister explain to the two men why that he thinks 
that being forced to leave Australia despite being owed $30,000 is not an example of significant hardship. Senator Ellison. Uh, well, Mr. President, uh, I note that Senator Ludwig doesn't refer to a particular case, uh, and for privacy reasons, I can understand that. But uh, I'm not aware of the particular, the particular two instances that uh, uh, that the uh, that Senator Ludwig has referred to. Uh, but can I say that uh, Section 457 visas play a very important role in getting uh, industry the skilled labour it needs? And I mentioned the other day in this place the oversight that we've put in place in relation to 457 visas and uh, the fact that uh, uh, the uh, uh, workplace ombudsman has advised uh, that the cancellation of a visa holder's visa will not preclude them receiving any back payment owed, and that is in a general sense. Uh, as for the, the specifics of this case, uh, I'm quite prepared uh, to provide a briefing to uh, Senator Ludwig, uh, without revealing the details publicly, if he doesn't want to. Uh, but I'm not aware of the particular instance involved. Um, uh, the only advice I have is that the workplace ombudsman has advised the department that cancellation of the visas holder, uh, the visa holder's visa, will not Senator preclude Conroy. them from receiving any back payment owed. Now, um, that that's my advice. If Senator Ludwig has any further detail, uh, he can take them up with me. Supplementary question, Senator Ludwig. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary question. The minister can look at the uh, Sydney Morning Herald on the 19th of September to perhaps gain a few more details in respect of it. He might like to get back. He might like to get back to the, the Senate with an answer to the question. But while he's doing that, doesn't this case, in the words of the Sydney Morning Herald journalist Malcolm Knox, and I quote, lay down a template for any employer wishing to import cheap labourers and rip them off? Does the minister, though, seriously think that the two workers will not be disadvantaged from pursuing their underpayment claims if they are forced to leave? Doesn't this case again expose the fact that the government is allowing the 457 visa scheme to be used as a way of driving down wages and conditions of Australian workers? Senator Ellison. Well, now that I've got some, uh, some more information to identify the source of the question, the newspaper reports referred to by Senator Ludwig, uh, I can say that on the advice I have, the, uh, uh, the, both visa holders and the employer uh, have provided false and misleading information to the department. Uh, the visa holders were happy to go along with this employment and relationship until it broke down. It was only then that it came to the attention of the department, workplace ombudsman and New South Wales Police. The investigation is now with the New South Wales Police, and in those circumstances, I won't comment any further. Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Abetz. I refer the Minister to false claims being made that the Howard government's workplace laws don't provide a strong safety net for Australian workers and their families. Is the minister aware of any evidence which contradicts these false claims? Further, what is the minister's response to claims that any worker can be sacked at any time on the pretext of operational reasons? Order. Senator Carr. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr President, and can I thank the intellectually robust Senator Fifield for his question. Mr President, the fact is Australian workers today have a very strong safety net, a safety net which I venture to say is stronger than at any time in our history. And Mr President, under the workplace relations system, we have legislated minimum conditions which cannot be traded away. And under the fairness test, conditions cannot be traded unless there is fair compensation. And all this, Mr President, is enforced by a strong, independent policeman, the Workplace Ombudsman. Last week, the Ombudsman secured a successful prosecution and a massive record fine against a business who broke the law by trying to force employees to sign AWAs against the law. And yesterday, we saw the Ombudsman advise a company that their proposed AWAs failed the fairness test and would have to be corrected. And today, another company was fined almost $25,000 for 
for pressuring a worker to sign an AWA as a result of a workplace ombudsman prosecution. And despite this overwhelming success, the Labor Party will abolish the workplace ombudsman and leave these workers unprotected. Now, I was also asked by Senator Fifield about claims being made by those opposite and their union masters about dismissal for operational reasons being an open book for employers. Well, here's what one of those misleading ACTU ads says about someone losing their job. They said it was for operational reasons. Two weeks later, they advertised my job for $25,000 less. This case is still before the Commission, so I can't comment on the specifics, although I note that the ACTU ad preempts the outcome. But, Mr President, can I advise the Senate that the law is this? You cannot dismiss someone for operational reasons unless you can prove your business is facing financial crisis if you keep the person on. Now today, Mr President, another case of an, un of an alleged unfair dismissal was brought to my attention. It's about an employee taking action over an, unfair, over an alleged unfair dismissal by her heartless boss. The boss says her redundancy was the result of a, quote, genuine business decision, in other words, an operational reason. He also said that the employee was made redundant because he said the business wanted to outsource some of its services to Victoria. Quote, we would be getting a lot more for considerably less outlay, he said. And of course, this boss is a trade union boss, and the, and the employment or employer I was referring to was in fact a trade union. And guess which trade union it was? The Community and Public Sector Union. And if I am not mistaken, that is the trade union to which Mr Rudd, the would be Prime Minister of this country, belongs to. So once again we have a classic case, Mr President, a classic case of the Labor Party and the trade union movement saying do as we say, not as we do. And of course, when you expose the activities of the trade union movement and how heartless they are with their employees, you realise the cant that is involved in the ACTU. Order, Order Senator Batch, your time, time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Ellison. My question concerns petrol sniffing and the eight-point plan for the rollout of non-sniffable opal fuel in the central desert region. Can the minister tell us how successfully opal fuel is being taken up by providers within the region identified in the eight-point plan and if measures are in place to enforce retailer compliance? Is the minister aware of reports that three roadhouses within the identified region are still stocking sniffable fuel, including Tea Tree, Rabbit Flat and Tillmouth Wells? What action is being taken to address this? Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, this is an important issue uh, in relation to the health care of Indigenous Australians. And, uh, we announced in the 2006 2007 budget uh, funding for uh, the uh, rollout of uh, opal non sniffable fuel. Uh, as I recall, it, uh, it was in the sum of around about $20 million, and we announced further funding in the uh, additional estimates of another $11 million plus for that. And, uh, that was also to allow for access to treatment services. Um, I am advised, Mr. President, that uh, the rollout of opal has been a, an important contributing factor in reducing the prevalence of petrol sniffing in remote communities across Australia. Uh, Senator Seward has inquired about the rollout, and I can say that as of uh, the 1st of July 2007, there are 104 sites across Australia supplying opal unleaded fuel. Uh, this includes 72 community, uh, communities, 29 service stations and roadhouses, and three pastoral properties. Uh, a survey conducted by the uh, uh, Ngampa uh, Health Council in October 2006 reported an 80 per cent reduction in the number of petrol sniffers in the APY lands uh, since 2004, and that same body conducted a six-month follow-up survey 
in May this year. This identified a further reduction of more than 50 per cent since October last year, which is a very good result indeed. Uh, with the exception of two communities, no petrol sniffing was recorded in the APY lands for the period October 2006 to May 2007. Uh, anecdotal evidence suggests that petrol sniffing uh, is no, lo no longer regarded as an attractive expression of ad adolescent peer group experimentation or acting out, as it's referred to. And uh, I think that's a great deal of progress, Mr. President. There's still more work to be done, um, and I can say that uh, around four, uh, just over four million dollars was allocated in the recent Northern Territory emergency response uh, to address petrol sniffing. Uh, Senator Seward uh, had in her other part of the question the take-up by some particular road houses. I'm not aware, three of them. They're not. I'm not aware of the situation in relation to those particular road houses. I'll take that up with the minister and advise the Senate. But what I can say to the Senate is that uh, there has been a great deal of success in rolling this out, and that uh, uh, from uh, independent reviews, it would appear that there has been a uh, significant reduction in petrol sniffing, which is indeed very good news. Uh, in relation to the, uh, the health of Indigenous uh, communities, and particularly young Indigenous people. Uh, it is something that we have committed a, a good deal of funding to. Uh, we will continue to work on this, and uh, I acknowledge Senator Seward's interest in it. Uh, it is something which we should all be interested in. It is something of a great importance uh, in the Indigenous health sector. And, uh, of course, uh, uh, I will have a look at those three roadhouses and get back to the Senate. Supplementary question, Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate the minister's undertaking. Um, I'd like to also know that if, whether the minister would be concerned that if the reports are correct, and that in fact sniffable fuel is available at Tea Tree in particular, which is just near Tennant Creek, I, as I understand it, it's planned to roll out sniffable, non-sniffable fuels into Tennant Creek. Will the availability of sniffable fuel undermine that rollout in Tennant Creek? And secondly, has the government investigated a reported outbreak of petrol sniffing among young people in Tea Tree earlier this year? Senator Ellison. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, again, that's something I don't have uh, detail on as to the particular community. Uh, but I would say that the government's position is quite clear. We want to see this taken up. Uh, we want to see the, uh, the opal fuel used, and uh, that's why we're expending all this money. Uh, so certainly I'll follow that up and uh, advise the Senate accordingly. Senator, J Senator Boyce. Uh, Mr President, my question is to the Minister for the Arts and Sports, Senator Brandis. Would the minister inform the Senate about the current state of the arts industry in Australia? And how has the Australian government supported the arts? Is the minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Brandis. Yeah, good question. Thanks, Mr. Um, President. Thank you very much, Senator Boyce, for that question. I know this is an area that interests you a great deal. I'm delighted to inform you through you, Mr. President, Senator Boyce, about the very strong support that the Australian government, throughout the life of the Howard government, has given to the arts in Australia. Um, and I'm, I am also, I am also, I'm pleased to say, aware of alternative policy, Senator Boyce. Senator I am aware Ford, of alternative no. policy. Let me, excuse me, Senator Kibel Carr. I am speaking now, order, Mr. Order, Mr. Order, Mr. President. Order, order. Senator Brandis, you will address the Senator by his proper name. I withdraw, Mr. President. Comrade, it was only an affectionate nickname. I have got something of a weakness for affectionate nicknames. Mr President, since the last Keating government budget in 1995 to this year's 12th Howard, 13th Howard government budget, fail, um, funding for the arts in Australia has been increased by 400 and, from $410 million to $680 million, an increase of 65.8 per cent over that period. There have been increases in particular sectors of arts funding, an increase in funding to the Australia Council, which over the lifetime of the Howard government has had its funding increase Mr. President, from $73 million 12 years ago to $161 million this year, an increase of 110 per cent over the period. Uh, increases in funding of the visual arts and crafts strategy, 
including a 27 per cent increase of funding for that sector over the previous year and Senator an increase of in 34 per cent of the major performing arts companies uh, over the previous triennium. So, Mr. Um, President, there, have been there has been very, very strong support for the arts in Australia from the Howard government, not to mention, of course, the film package, which I'm delighted that the Senate passed yesterday, which invests $280 million over four years in the Australian film industry. But I want to get to some alternative policies. Now, I could tell you, Senator Boyce, that one of the policies of the Australian Labor Party is to reduce funding to the arts. That's certainly been, that's certainly been the experience of state Labor governments. The Australia Council has recently prepared a document on arts and cultural funding by, by state and territory governments for 2007-08, which discloses a reduction in arts funding by the New South Wales Labor government in the coming year by $19.8 million or 6.5 per cent, and a reduction in funding of arts by the Queensland government of $53.9 million, or 20.5 per cent, Senator Boyce. So if you want to know what the Labor Party would do if they're in power, look no further than the state Labor governments that aren't in power. But in fairness, to give them their due, Mr Garrett, the Shadow Minister, produced a document, a very flimsy document, Mr President, last Friday on the federal Labor arts funding. Now, they're going to have a review of the funding model of the Australia Council. That's on page four. On page five, we discover they're going to have a review of the performance of ABAP, the Australian Business Arts Foundation. Then on, we go to page seven and we find that we're going to have a review of the Regional Arts Australia strategy. And we only have to go over to page eight to find that they will consider the review of the Australian National Academy of Music. Now, that's, I haven't even read it very carefully, Senator Boyce, but that's four reviews in the first eight pages. And given that page one is a blank piece of paper and page two is a preamble, page three is a table of contents, and page four is some rodimentard about the Howard government, that's not bad going at all. What, what you will find in particularly interesting, Order. Senator Boyce. Order, Senator Brannis, your time has expired. Senator Boyce. Supplementary, please, uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would like the, to ask the Minister for Arts and Sports if he could further elaborate on the alternatives that uh, are not being proposed. Thank you. Senator Brandis. Uh, thank you so much, Senator Boyce, because well, I won't weary you with all the other reviews in the remaining few pages of this very, very flimsy polemic. I've only got a minute, but I might mention what the, what the um, Labor Party arts policy document doesn't cover. Nothing about the visual arts. Nothing about the visual arts other than some remarks about Indigenous art. And when it comes to Indigenous art, the Australian Labor Party will have a review of policies in relation to the protection of Indigenous artists. There is nothing about the major performing arts companies, Mr. President. We're not even going to have a review of them, except, of course, the review of the Australian National Academy of Music. Nothing, for instance, about NIDA. Nothing about the Australian Ballet School. Uh, there is there is nothing about infrastructure. Not a word about infrastructure. No mention of, in, of literature other than in the context of Indigenous art, where we're going Order. to have a review as to the availability of literature uh, in, in, to in, in the Indigenous sector. Order. We're Order, Minister. Your time has expired. Order. Order. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Robetz, uh, Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. And I refer the Minister to information supplied to the Senate last night about quarantine arrangements at Eastern Creek Quarantine Facility. Can the Minister confirm that so-called additional security and quarantine measures were implemented after the 24th of August when equine influenza was detected at that facility? Can the Minister confirm that these measures include, and I quote, a requirement for all persons entering the horse quarantine area to undertake disinfection of their footwear, to shower on arrival at the station, to shower when leaving and to wear aqueous supplied protective clothing at all times while in the station. Given the facility was supposed to be a secure quarantine area before 24 August, can the minister explain why these requirements were not followed before the disease outbreak? And given the overwhelming probability that the outbreak was initiated at Eastern Creek, 
Couldn't the spread of equine influenza have been prevented if these basic measures were followed prior to the 24th of August? Senator, or Senator Carr. Senator Abetz. Mr President, uh, I think for one Senator Carr made a worthwhile interjection because he said, what about the inquiry? And he is absolutely right. Because this parliament, because this parliament, this Senate today, this Senate today, and before the arrogant leader of the opposition gets too whipped up, his own party supported this. His own party supported this. There was unanimity around this chamber. Nobody opposed it, other than, it seems, the Leader of the Opposition, if he would have been in here, he would have opposed it. But the reality is it got through this Senate on the voices. And the reason, and the reason it did was because it made such good common sense. Rather than Senator O'Brien trying to play Inspector Clouseau, we said, we said yeah, rather than having a bumbling uh, uh, inspector going around, we thought a High Court judge of the experience of Ian Callan and QC would be the sort of person that we would want to inquire into all the aspects surrounding the outbreak of equine influenza. And what I would invite Senator O'Brien to do, if he thinks he can make cheap political comment about this, can I tell you? that the $3.6 billion industry that surrounds the 10,000 commercial horses in this country and all the people that gain their livelihoods from the horse industry, they do want to know the answer, but they don't want to hear the answers in a political climate such as Senator O'Brien is trying to whip up. What they want is a rigorous, robust inquiry as will be conducted by Mr Callanan. And therefore, whether certain procedures were or were not followed at Eastern Creek is not something on which I am going to speculate on. That is something for Mr Callanan to determine and for him to make commentary on. And so uh, I leave it at that, uh, Mr President. This is a serious matter. Believe it or not, the Senate unanimously agreed to this inquiry just a matter of a few hours ago. And what I suggest to all honourable senators, especially Senator O'Brien, seeing he's so interested in showers, he should take a cold shower, take a deep breath, take a deep breath, and allow Mr Callanan to do his work. That is very Order. Uh, uh, order. 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 Take your seat, Senator Brown. Order. Senator Betts, Senator Betts, I did not hear what Senator Ray said, but I did hear what you said, and you must withdraw. The President, you heard what I said, and I withdraw unequivocally. If Senator Ray is decent, he'll come round to my office, we'll have a cup of coffee and uh, get rid of that. Senator Ray. Senator Betts, I withdraw. Thank you. Supplementary question, Senator O'Brien. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Order. President. Uh, I, I, Order. I remind. Order. Sit, sit down, Senator O'Brien. I'm not going to continue. Order. We are not going to continue with Senator O'Brien's supplementary question unless you maintain order. Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. President. I remind the minister to, that uh, my question went to the actions or inaction of the government prior to the outbreak, and I suggest that even this government can answer their, uh, the questions about what they did or didn't do with an, out, an inquiry telling them what they did or didn't do. But can the minister guarantee that the absence of these basic precautions, like wearing protective clothing and disinfect, disinfecting footwear, did not facilitate the spread of equine influenza from the Eastern Creek facility? Why did it take this devastating equine influenza outbreak for the government to put these very, very basic arrangements in place at what is supposed to be a secure quarantine facility? Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, once again, uh, Senator O'Brien is uh, asking me to speculate on the matters surrounding this unfortunate outbreak. 
and I don't think it serves the uh, benefits of the industry in any shape or form for a Senator O'Brien to make assertions for me to uh, seek to answer them. That is why we have Mr Callanan inquiring into all the matters surrounding this. And, uh, and Senator Sherry interjects an inquiry, an inquiry that has got the backing of the unanimous support of this chamber. Of course, Senator Sherry was absent as well, so he wouldn't know the basis. But Senator Sherry and Senator O'Brien ought to get together and work out with Senator Evans what the opposition stance is on this. But I thought they had gone out to the industry saying that they support this inquiry. Can I tell you, there's no ifs and buts with us. We support the inquiry. We initiated it, and we want all the details to come out, not as a result of a um, blundering uh, Inspector O'Brien undertaking Sherry. an inquiry, but as a result of professional people such as Mr Callanan undertaking the task on behalf of all Australians. Before I call Senator Bartlett, I draw the attention of honourable senators to the, president, to the presence in the gallery of an Australian Political Exchange Council delegation from the United States. On behalf of all senators, I wish you a warm welcome uh, to Australia and, in particular, to the Senate. Yeah. Sen Senator Bartlett. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Community Services. Uh, noting the Minister's comments uh, in a number of question times, including as uh, recently as today, about and I quote, the complete failure of state governments in regard to public housing, why is the federal government choosing this moment to defund the community housing program for Indigenous Australians, which will shift uh, most of those Indigenous Australians from community housing in urban areas onto the record waiting lists for public housing, which is overseen by those very same state governments, particularly at precisely the time of uh, record competition for private rental housing and the worst housing affordability figures on record. I didn't hear the, who you addressed the question to, Senator Butler, but I presume it's Senator Scullion. Senator Scullion. Uh, uh, th thank you, Mr. President, and I, and I thank the Senator for the question. It, um, whilst the Senator was aware of the $514 million uh, commitment uh, to Indigenous housing and, and the maintenance associated with that uh, yesterday, he, he may not be aware of some other circumstances that would perhaps put not only that contribution but our policy in context. Uh, Mr President, um, at, a, at the most recent uh, housing ministers' conference that I chaired that was held in Darwin some time ago, uh, we uh, provided an explanation of the current uh, and future policies in regard to the Commonwealth's investment in Indigenous housing to the remaining housing ministers at that conference. And the, the way of the future is this, Mr President. Um, we will no longer be funding Indigenous housing organisations, uh, and the Senate is quite right there. Uh, but we have no intention of moving people out of those houses, in fact, quite to the contrary. We have now said that we will bring every one of those houses, in, if, if a, an Indigenous housing organisation chooses to do so, we will bring every one of those houses up to an acceptable standard. Now, that acceptable standard is the same standard as we would accept. The houses would be completely up to standard and the infrastructure would be, would be uh, the same. Uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, but then there was there, there is an interest then, of course, to ensure that the maintenance of those houses and the standard is maintained. So we will then be asking the Indigenous Housing Organisation to pass the responsibility of the of maintaining the tenancy agreements and those houses over to the state and territory governments. So it's been brought up to a standard. It's then been passed over to the state and territory governments, whose responsibility it is then to ensure that those houses are treated in the same way as every other house. So every three months, uh, for example, if you're a tenant uh, in a public house, someone will come and expect the house. Um, and they will say that, uh, for example, if there's some, some damage, there's a door kicked in or something like that, they may say, well, uh, there, there is a, a responsibility for the state and territory to not only repair the door, but to have, to have some mechanism under which it can recoup uh, the costs of the door. The same maintenance re uh, requirements uh, that are on any other public housing. And the reason, Mr. President, that we have gone down that way is that uh, the current arrangements in terms of Indigenous housing organisations, of which I am familiar uh, in the Northern Territory, just simply haven't worked. Um, whether it's the capacity of the organisation, whether it's the governance arrangements, we're not really sure. 
They haven't worked, and that's why we've gone to this new model to ensure that uh, uh, Indigenous Australians will be able to live in, this, in the same place in the same houses, but those houses will be built to a standard. There will be now a responsibility for those people and the tenants that reflect the responsibility of any uh, uh, tenant landholder arrangements. That will now be moving to the responsibility of the state and territory governments uh, to maintain those tenancy agreements. Supplementary question, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, my, my question remains, um, given the minister himself has confirmed that uh, responsibility for maintaining these houses and acceptable standards will be pushed over to state and territory governments, who are exactly the same people who he has labelled earlier today as complete failures uh, with regards to public housing. Uh, how is it that uh, community, uh, Indigenous community housing organisations can have any confidence uh, that this will actually deliver better outcomes for Indigenous Australians in urban areas? Is the minister actually saying there is not a single Indigenous community housing organisation around the country? And he may be familiar with those in the Territory, but um, I'm certainly familiar with some in uh, urban Brisbane. Uh, is he saying that not a single one of those maintain their housing to acceptable standards and that uh, all of that housing should be transferred across to a state government that he has labelled as a complete failure in this area. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the senator for reminding me of my earlier uh, uh, statements in regard to how well we trust uh, and, and sometimes uh, reflecting on the performance of the state and territory governments. Yes, of course, we are nervous about those processes, but we are now in a situation where we are going in with our eyes wide open. Uh, there will be contractual arrangements to ensure not only that the standard that we have undertaken is in fact an acceptable standard and that is delivered, and that's on our side of the bargain, but we will be ensuring through contractual arrangements that the states and territory governments do abide by not only their word but through a contractual arrangement that the, those, those maintenance obligations, as should be through any tenants' agreements, are in fact adhered to. Senator Hogg. representing the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. I refer the Minister to a Citigroup review on the effect of climate change that found that Australia's big mining companies, BHP and Rio Tinto, were well prepared for the impact of climate change on their business. Given that Rio Tinto and BHP are prepared to recognise and plan for the impact of climate change on their business, why is the government not prepared to recognise and plan for the impact on climate change on Australia's farmers? Don't the severe reductions in ABARE crop forecasts show that climate change has the potential to cost the farm sector and our economy billions of dollars in lost earnings? How much longer does the agricultural sector have to wait for the government to put in place measures to help it adapt to climate change? Senator Abetz. Mr President, we as a government are well known for our position in uh, taking Australia forward and indeed taking the world community forward in relation to climate change. And Mr President, we are concerned to engage all sectors, all sectors of our economy. Senator Carr. Senator Carr, I've reminded you a number of times to cease interjecting. Sen Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, you thought if the Labor Party were genuinely interested in climate change, they would at least allow me to get 30 seconds into the answer before they get the bother boys of Senator Carr and others uh, starting to interject. Now, Mr. President, we, as a government, we as a government have uh, taken a considered stance and a stance that I think uh, is being accepted around the world as being the appropriate position. And that is, Mr President, to take the actions. And the arrogant leader of the opposition interjects again and says around the world. Yes, around the world, as was shown at the APEC conference, as was shown by the APEC conference, where we were able to get the United States, China and Russia and some of the big emitters actually sitting down together and working out how we can move forward together. And so, Mr President, here we are achieving on a grand scale Australia punching well above its weight. And the reason why is because we have credibility generally because of our Prime Minister and our Foreign Minister right around the world, but also because on this issue we have credibility. 
and a lot of countries accept that we do have credibility, despite the fact that we haven't signed up to Kyoto, because they accept that we have taken a rigorous and robust approach in relation to this. But, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr President, in relation to the agricultural sector, it needs to be remembered that Australia, to a large extent as well, is uh, one of the breadbaskets of the world. And we have a responsibility and a duty not only to our farming communities but also to those countries that we supply to try to provide uh, food as cheaply uh, as possible. Currently, the uh, agricultural sector is going through devastating consequences as a result of a drought, the drought, the proportion of which chances are we haven't seen since the Great uh, Federation drought of uh, 1901. And, uh, Mr. Mr President, uh, in all those circumstances, we have been saying that we will work with the agricultural community to deal with these issues that, in a way that they can adapt and ensure their ongoing viability. And of course, that is the thing that has underscored our total approach on this issue, and that is to make sure that every industry sector can cope, can deal with the challenges without sending them broke. And that is the big difference, Mr. President, between the Howard government's approach and, and uh, the, the Rudd uh, approach. Supplementary question, Senator Hogg. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, wasn't the Prime Minister's decision to specifically exclude the agriculture sector from his, his emissions task group evidence that this government has no regard for the role of agriculture in the potential solutions to climate change? Doesn't the government's failure to help our critical agricultural industries adapt to climate change show once again that the government is full of climate change sceptics, like the minister? who are not serious about tackling climate change. Order. Order. Senator Betts. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, above the cacophony, I think I did hear the questions, and there were two of them, and I can answer them for the hon. Senator in the following manner. The answer to the first question is no. The answer to the second question is no. I ask that further questions be placed on the notes. Senator Crossan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I, in fact, have uh, a question to ask of you, uh, and I would like to seek an answer to the following questions. Uh, I understand that a decision has been made to permanently close and dismantle the Women in Parliament display, which is exhibited uh, on the first. Sen Senator Crossan, I'm reminded you do need leave. Oh, to I'll, ask I'll seek leave to ask you a question. Yeah. Is leave granted for me. Leave is thank granted. You. Uh, I understand that a, uh, that a decision has been made uh, to permanently close and dismantle the Women in Parliament display and exhibition, which is uh, currently on the first floor of the Senate side in this building. Uh, I further understand that this information will now only be seen online or in a booklet publication. So I ask you. Could, uh, well, we ask, thank you, Senator Patterson, on behalf perhaps of all women parliamentarians in this place, can you please inform the Senate who made this decision, why there was no consultation about this decision? I also ask what is the reason for this decision? And given that women only constitute 28.3 per cent of this parliament, why this government will not support a continuing uh, of this display on public view and complement that display with any online or printed information? And can I also ask, will the pictures or paintings of speakers or presidents in this building also be removed and placed online, just like the women will be? Of order. I, I just make the point that it's not appropriate for you to be asked about the government's position. You're here as the presiding officer of the Senate, but I presume the question was not meant to be to you in relation to the government. If there's a question to the government, you should, the senator should ask for the government's position, but you may answer as your capacity as the presiding officer. That, 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 is, that is order. Order. Senator Crossan, as you're well aware, I've only been in this position for four weeks, and I am still acquainting myself with many decisions that have been made over the past period of months. Uh, this is not an issue that I have seen. It's not a question that's been asked of me before. 
I can promise you that I will look into it and get back to you and answer you comprehensively in full. Uh, motions to take note of answers. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I rise to take note of answers by Senator, by Senator Scully and to opposition questions. In terms of the main issue of housing affordability, Australians don't have a government that runs on sound economic principles with rigorous policy development processes working for the benefit of Australians, working families. We do have a government that has one guiding principle and one guiding principle only, and that is its marketing spin of its research agency, Crosby Texter. A government that will do anything, say anything and spend any amount to win office in the forthcoming election. A government desperately manufacturing lines, desperately manufacturing lines and policies on the run in an attempt to create an agenda. And we see that. When it, comes to, when it comes to its own backbench and says, there's a whiteboard, what we want is some good ideas about housing affordability. Too late, too short. It's a short-termism that's typical of this government. It's not a way of engaging with your backbench. It demonstrates that the government doesn't have any policy, doesn't have any, any ability to be able to lead the debate on housing affordability. Instead, it wants to simply jot down ideas on a whiteboard and then wipe it off and then wipe it off. That's what it wants to be able to do after the next election. What we have, is, of course, is a government that's more interested in spin. It doesn't respect the difficulty that working families are facing out in the community. It isn't mindful of the struggles and challenges that working families have to meet every day. But let's look at the evidence. Over the last few weeks, we've seen the attempts of the Prime Minister to promote himself as a strong man. You mention it, uh, the, opposite, the government today, about how he's out there in a strong way, but what he's doing is it's a furphy. He's aggressively attacking the states, but as a proxy for the opposition. We've seen really the truth come out, though. It's about pork barrelling and largesse reaching new levels from this government because it knows only one way, and that one way is to spend its way out of a problem. And it's done that every time. It's not talking about, and you see that with the uh, words like aspirational nationalism, trying to come up with phrases to jag the public's interest. We'll stop the rot. Don't try to find a phrase like aspirational nationalism to get someone's attention. Come up with a good policy. Come up with a proper approach. Come up with something rather than short-termism, rather than the more ugly and clumsy juxtaposition of ideas and language since the Prime Minister brought us incentivisation back in 1987. But what we do know from Crosby Texter is how it will play a brand of federalism politics that is neither likely to work nor to endure as a template for government. But working families are juggling. They're juggling work commitments, increased consumer prices, increased uncertainty over their working conditions, and they're worried about their children in the workplace as well. They're worried about how they're going to afford their housing houses, how they're going to then ensure that they're going to be able to get to work because this government hasn't, hasn't uh, built critical infrastructure. They're worried about how they're going to compete in the marketplace. They're worried about how they're going to ensure that all of those matters are addressed. This government hasn't invested in significant broadband services. What this government has in fact done, in fact all it's done, is found a label, a label to stick across everything. And that's why the Prime Minister had this to say. They've never been better off. That's what he's had to say about it. Never been better off. When it's reported in the press, people are struggling. They're losing their houses, quite frankly, because this government doesn't care. The research shows that the number of households enduring mortgage stress will rise above 600,000 in the coming months. And the Australian mortgage industry reports by Fujitsu and JP Morgan reveal that 113,000 families may be forced to give up their homes because of the mortgage stress. This is how out of touch this 11-year-old government has become, out of touch and doesn't care. As working families tighten their belt, they embark on, and this government instead embarks on a spending spree devoid of any purpose other than keeping the howds in Kirribilli. 
I should say, Mr and Mrs Howard. No wonder that yesterday the op in the opposition party room uh, it's no wonder, of course, that when you look at, and Senator Minchin, I think, summed it up some time ago, when, in terms of the IR debate, they don't want to then tell us what they're going to do, provide any future direction. Senator Ludwig, your what time has expired. Senator Boyce. Senator Boyce. Mr Deputy President, um, I would like to also take note of answers relating to housing affordability. I find it completely bemusing that it would cause concern to the opposition that uh, for two and a half solid hours yesterday, members of the coalition managed to come up with good, fresh, innovative ideas about ways to act to help this country, not just have committees and reference groups to think about what to do. Good ideas have been a hallmark of this government and will continue to be. It is somewhat bizarre to think that having good ideas would be seen as a failure or a weakness of any sort. But let's look particularly at some of the facts behind the situation regarding housing affordability. Yes, there are some families that are struggling, and yes, our government is working to assist those families. Let's also look at what the state governments are doing to assist those families. We do have uh, departments in all states called the Department of Housing. What are they actually doing to help families with any problems? What have they done to develop greater rental stock? What have they done to assist people who are in any sort of a crisis, apart from sell off some houses, not worry about demand? or supply. Let's look what they've done to assist those families who may be about to experience mortgage stress. What have they done with their growth taxes, such as the GST, with their growth taxes relating to stamp duty and land tax, even, shamefully, their growing revenues from gambling? What do they do with that funds that might assist? families who have any concerns about their ability to afford houses. Let's turn that, flip that round and look at it from the other perspective. What has the federal government done to assist families, working families? And yes, we are proud that we can say working families, because there are more families than ever before currently in work, currently with jobs. This is part of the reason that these people can afford the mortgages that they have to buy houses. There are more people than ever before in a position to be able to get themselves into the housing market. Let's look also at what we've done in terms of reducing tax over the past 12 months, new rates that came in in July this year that give families the opportunity to invest that little bit more in their mortgage. In fact, if you look at the current situation regarding mortgages, you find that more than 25 per cent of people are more than a year ahead in their repayments on their mortgages. Half the people in Australia who have mortgages are ahead in their repayments. That's the very sensible attitude that a lot of Australian households have taken to give themselves a buffer in case of problems that might arise, certainly not problems with small increases in interest rates, but the sorts of dramas and problems that can af affect any family as it goes through life, the sorts of extra crises that can come up. We should also, I think, look at the Reserve Bank's uh, notes in terms of the views of households themselves around their personal finances. Most households report that their personal finances are stronger today than they were 12 months ago. They have continued to benefit, continued to reap the benefits of a strong economy with high employment and lower tax rates, lower takes from the federal government. Not so, unfortunately, in terms of the state governments. The states were dragged kicking and screaming to get rid of their 
taxes on bank deposits and on other areas, things that they were supposed to give up in exchange for getting the GST. And what have they done with those growth taxes that they've received from the federal government? Very, very little to help families. Senator Ludwig mentioned infrastructure. Well, gee, I thought roads and buses and gutters were the province of state governments. I think this is where we should be looking if we want to look for the Senator Boyce, your housing time has affordability. Expired. Senator Cross. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. Well, I rise to uh, take note of the answers given to us today by Senator Scullion in relation to, uh, of course, housing affordability. This is an absolute policy for his own when it comes uh, to the Howard government. Uh, and if it's not a policy for his own, then it's certainly a, a policy area where there are many different ideas and messages coming uh, out of their members of parliament. One only has to look at uh, the papers today to show that there are as almost as many different policies on housing affordability as there are government MPs in this place. Uh, according to uh, newspaper reports today, we have uh, policy number one coming from uh, Ms Mirabilla and Senator Ferguson, who are suggesting that first home buyers should receive the benefits of negative gearing on the home they live in. Then there's policy number two from Ms Dana Vale, suggesting that the Commonwealth should release land and build homes with the private sector. But, but wait, there's more. Policy number three in fact, comes from uh, Mr Pat Farmer, who suggests that the government should match dollar for dollar the money first homeowners saved for their deposit, up to, up to $50,000. And last but not least, there's policy number four, which is all the other MPs uh, in this government who are suggesting that the first homeowners grant uh, should in fact be raised. Well, coalition backbenchers are throwing policies uh, are around like it's going out of fashion. That's because they are desperate to have one clear, consistent policy from this government when it comes to housing affordability. But the Prime Minister and his cabinet ministers have been unable to lock in a concrete policy on how they want to, uh, to tackle uh, this issue. They're caught in a bind, you see. We've had nine consecutive interest rate rises under this government. Uh, and five, five interest rates rises since uh, the last election. So the pressure on getting this government to actually come up with a policy, a plan for the future, an idea about how they would tackle this if they were re-elected, uh, has shown that they've been caught out again by a lack of policy uh, on housing. It's embarrassing, we know, for their backbenchers who want to reiterate three or four different policies in any one day, just trying to get this government to actually lay down a plan for the future and a plan for people who actually want to buy and own uh, their own home. And of course, we had Mr Peter Lindsay, who uh, only last week blamed young people themselves for being priced out of the housing uh, market. After 11 years, uh, 11 long years, in fact, in government, and a housing market that has frozen out most young people and average wage earners, it's, it's actually see, astonishing to see that this government is in such disarray when it comes to having a plan or a policy for uh, housing affordability. Because at this point in time, statistics show us that the home ownership amongst young people has actually dropped during uh, this government's term in office. Uh, last week, the Real Estate Institute of Australia published figures showing that only 16.7 per cent of homes financed in June were purchased by first home buyers, compared with the historic average of 20 per cent. So the number of young uh, people buying and purchasing their own homes is dropping. This government refuses to accept those statistics or even act on them. According to the Mortgage, Mortgage Choices' latest survey, 28 per cent of Australians will be aged 41 years or older when they buy their first home. But even more sadly, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Australians will be simply unable to afford now to buy a home ever without any action by, uh, by this federal government. In fact, back on the 18th of July, the Australian newspaper had this to say, clearly 
It's all a bit beyond the Prime Minister. Clearly, it is a bit beyond this Prime Minister and, uh, and this government to actually come up with a plan to tackle housing affordability. And we know that data also released this year shows that purchasing a home in a capital city has become even tougher, with the Australian dream of home ownership slipping further out of the reach of families. But this is a government who has no plan for housing affordability, no blueprint about what they would do into the future, want to languish as in the past, pretend they have a track record on this when the statistics show us otherwise, and after nine consecutive interest rate rises, five interest rate rises since the last election, Senator Crossan, your this is time a policy has expired. Senator Cormann. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I also rise to take note of uh, the answer by Senator Scullion. Another day in the Senate and another day of empty Labor Party rhetoric. We on this side of the chamber, we do take the pressures on working families very seriously, very seriously indeed. And that is why we're focused on a strong economy, on creating jobs, on increasing real wages and on keeping taxes low. The reality is this, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, in an environment where we've got a growing population, the main thing that we can do to improve housing affordability is to increase supply of, of affordable land. Now, if, if uh, senators on the other side of the chamber, through you, Mr. Deputy President, were really so concerned about improving the housing affordability across Australia, what they would be doing is phoning the Premier of New South Wales, the Premier of South Australia, the Premier of Victoria, the Premier of Western Australia. Indeed, through you, Mr. Deputy President, I call on my esteemed colleague, Senator Ruth Webber, to phone the Premier of Western Australia, Alan Carpenter, her very good friend, and the Minister for um, Planning and Infrastructure, Lana McTiernan, and to call on them to release more land, to cut red tape, and to call on um, the Treasurer of, in Western Australia, Eric Whipper, to reduce those uh, extreme uh, property taxes, st stamp duty, land taxes. There's great disincentives on investors to get involved in the housing market and make housing af uh, affordable housing available to renters across Western Australia. Today, all we've heard is empty rhetoric. What we need is a plan for a strong economy. What we need is a plan uh, to create jobs. What we need is increasing real wages, which is why the uh, workplace relations reforms that the Howard government has introduced in 1996 and subsequently are so important. I had the great privilege of talking about this uh, last night. But what is Labor, what is Labor proposing? Labor is proposing to abolish the Australian workplace agreements. Labor is proposing to abolish the Australian Building and Construction, Construction Commission. Not only is that going to push the cost of housing up, it is actually going to have a negative impact on, on real wages, it's going to have a negative impact on employment, and it's going to make it more difficult for people across Australia to afford their own home. And it's an absolute disgrace, uh, Mr Deputy President. I have actually experienced in my own home state of Western Australia exactly what can happen uh, when Labor comes into government and pursues those sorts of policies, because indeed, particularly in the building and construction industry, which is so relevant when it comes to affordable housing, um, straight after the um, Gallup Labor government was elected in 2001, in less than two weeks, unions were going on a rampage across all of the uh, major building sites across Western Australia. And of course, should Labor be successful, God help us, at the next election, we are very likely to see exactly the same. And the impact of that, less affordable housing, not more affordable housing. Now, Senator Ludwig, uh, Ludwig spoke about um, marketing and how the government is focused on marketing. I don't think that there is any lessons uh, that uh, we can take from the Labor Party on that, because today I came across this article in The Age, Brax Water Ads Broke Budget, and I thought I just might read that into a handsaw because it's, it's quite outrageous what, when, when I came across this. Controversial advertisement star starring former Premier Steve Brax spruiking the government's water plans cost taxpayers more than $1.7 million, 70 per cent more than Mr Brax admitted at the time. Documents obtained by the Age under Freedom of Information reveal taxpayers funded television, radio, print and internet advertisements shown in June had a price tag of $1.7 million, and that's of course those infamous ads of uh, the then Premier um, Steve Brax in uh, the helicopter coming down in the helicopter trying to sort of spruik, you know, you know, sell himself. Now, the issue of housing affordability is a very serious issue. 
Uh, there are many uh, families across Australia who are aspiring to buy their first home and who in the current environment are finding it tough. We are the first ones to acknowledge that. And all of us as policymakers across Australia, whether it's the state or the federal level, we ought to very seriously reflect and very seriously consider what sort of policies are able to make a positive difference to those uh, families across Australia. But there's no we're not going to be helped, and those families are not going to be helped by empty political rhetoric from the other side. If you're really seriously concerned, if you're really seriously interested in making a difference, pick up the phone, talk to your premiers, talk to your state ministers, get them to cut red tape, get them to reduce their property taxes, and get them to get off their backsides and do something about it. Now, I mean, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I'm feeling very passionate about this because, I mean, in Western Australia, the level of taxes, the level of property taxes, the disincentives for people to actually uh, buy their own home or the disincentives uh, for people to invest uh, in, um, in properties that they might make available for uh, affordable rental housing are just uh, so enormous that, like, uh, we're having very, very serious issues, particularly Senator Cormann, in our, your time in our has regional expired. Areas. Senator Weber. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Well, all I can say, with all due respect to you, Senator Cormann, is I must live in a different part of Perth to you. Because if you were as aware of what is going on in Perth, you wouldn't be interested in the blame game, because that's all those opposite have. You'd actually understand what is happening in the northern suburbs. You would understand that in the electorate of Stirling, 34 per cent of people are suffering mortgage stress. People come and see me regularly when I'm um, in that community, complaining about the $300 a week they have to pay to rent a house in Balga or Nolamara. You wouldn't be interested in playing the blame game. You would be interested in sitting down and talking about real solutions if you really did care about those people. Obviously, your colleague Peter Lindsay from Queensland understands, although he likes to blame young people themselves, um, because he does blame young people themselves. Uh, other, um, other members of your party have talked about their, their open about the fact that there really is a housing affordability crisis. They talk about young families un under mortgage stress being forced to sit on milk crates. What is, I mean, what, what, is what we need to do is work together and address the problem. And all of those people in Stirling, those 34 per cent of people that are suffering from mortgage stress, they all remember your Prime Minister and your Treasurer, L1 and L2, as they're colloquially known around here now, promising to keep interest rates at record lows. Well, five interest rate increases later, they, are not, they do not believe it when all of a sudden you have a brainstorming session and you decide that you care. And the way you demonstrate that you care is to blame shift. It's to blame someone else. Or you say, or in the case of the Treasurer after the last interest rate, right, he says actually housing prices are higher than they've ever been, and they are higher than they have been because more people are in work and more people are able to afford to borrow to pur purchase more expensive housing. When asked, so Treasurer, this means there is no crisis, well, no, he said. Well, no. So you cannot have it both ways. You cannot say, yes, there is a crisis and we're going to blame everyone else, even though you're the party that's been in government for 11 long years, you're the party that, that has been responsible for the five successive interest rate rises since the last election, or you can have, or you can have the Treasurer, L2 as he's colloquially known now, saying, well, actually, there's no crisis. He doesn't seem to accept that there is a crisis. Or you can perhaps go for the third option, which is the option that Senator Ludwig was referring to, which is to actually simply come up with another marketing plan. Get your mates from Crosby Texter out there and work out what the spin needs to be. In the real world, the real world that is the northern suburbs of Perth, where 34 per cent of people are suffering mortgage stress, in the real world, working families are facing the prospect of not being able to afford to buy their own home. They're facing the prospect of not being able to afford to pay $300 a week to live in Balga and Nolamara. That is the real world. That is what is happening today. And after 11 long years, your government has done nothing to help people uh, face those challenges. 
Those families are obliged to pay nearly one third of their incomes on home loan repayments, the highest ever percentage of their income. That's, what, that's the Howard, Costello, Vale, whoever wants to claim responsibility for this government's legacy. That's their legacy to the northern suburbs of Perth. And what's the answer? Blame someone else. A scattergun, a brainstorming. Um, exercise yesterday where we, all talk, we had all of a sudden lots of different issues and lots of different options, or just play the blame game rather than accepting responsibility and helping these families that are in mortgage stress or the young families that are looking to buy their first home actually helping them, actually showing that you accept some responsibility for five interest rate rises in a row. When you add to this to those families that are spending over one third of their income to uh, try and uh, meet their mortgage repayments, when you add to that the uncertainties they face in the labour market thanks to work choices, that, uh, that uh, labour market system that dare not speak its name anymore, then it is little wonder that families are feeling very nervous and very stressed about the future. So what do you do? As I say, this government's, uh, this government's typical solution, let's uh, have a scattergun approach, let's blame everyone else, then let's get Crosby texted to perhaps test Senator a few Weber, of the your lines time has that were expired. tried. The question is that on the same matter, the question is that the motion moved by Senator Ludwig be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I'd like to move to take note of the government's answer to the, uh, to the question on petrol sniffing. And as I said, I thank the, I thank the minister at the time for, ex for outlining how the, how the uh, opal non-sniffable fuel um, is being rolled out in the region. As the um, Senate qu inquiry into um, petrol sniffing pointed out, it, was, it is very important that the non-sniffable opal fuel is rolled out across the entire region if we are going to deal with the scourge of petrol sniffing. And as the minister outlined, this is starting to be to prove successful. Unfortunately, we are starting to hear worrying reports that there are a number of um, petrol stations or uh, roadhouses in that region, the identified region of the Eight Point Plan, that are in fact are not stocking or are continuing, sorry, to sell sniffable unleaded fuel. Now, if there is a source of sniffable unleaded, un, sorry, if there is a source of sniffable fuel in the region, this is of course going to undermine and undercut the rollout of sniffable fuel. This is why I think it's very important that the government um, gets, gets to, comes to grips with and has an understanding of it, where sniffable fuel is still being sold in the region and has a strategy to deal with it, because the whole system will be undermined if there is sniffable fuel available in this region. Um, along with these worrying reports that service, uh, roadhouses are continuing to stop sniffable fuel is that it is is the reports that, in fact, there were cases of um, petrol sniffing reported early in the year from tea tree, which actually exactly is a classic example of what I was talking about, which is where, if the fuel is available, people will access the fuel, and, then, and therefore rolling out the opal fuel will, in fact, not accomplish its aims. So I, th as I think it's very important that the government does, in fact, follow up these particular roadhouses and see if they are in fact sniffing, uh, selling sniffable fuel, and if they are, require them to only stock, to only stock opal fuel, because that is the key component. What the Senate inquiry fa um, found and recommended in its report, that was unanimously accepted, uh, which was a unanimous report, is that the opal fuel, putting in a non-sniffable fuel, buys time to put in the other strategies that keep people, kids permanently off sniffing fuel. So in other words, you need sniffing petrol. You, actually, you need the fuel, you need the non sniffable fuel in there, and then you implement the diversionary programs and the other programs that help um, keep people and, and other health, health programs to help the kids that have already been affected or people already affected by sniffing fuel help them to recover. So I urge the government to investigate the claims that there are at least three uh, roadhouses in the region that are, that are still supplying sniffable fuel, and in fact they're actively. The reports are even worse in that they, the reports are that they are actively undermining 
um, the rollout of the program by, in, by saying and implying that um, opal fuel in fact damages cars, which is a continuation of the undermining of the program that occurred in Alice Springs. The government eventually acted on those, on that um, what was happening in Alice Springs, and rolled out a quite comprehensive media awareness program that, assu that assured consumers and buyers of petrol that in fact the opal fuel did not damage cars and there's the proof of that because the automobile association has proved that it doesn't damage cars but uh, as i understand it there's still some rumors circulating in the region that it does now this is particularly important right now because the next phase of the eight point plan or the roll the eight point plan to, on the rolling out of opal fuel is into tenant creek tea tree if, the, if the, um, what we're hearing on the ground is true, that Tea Tree Roadhouse is, is, not, is still stocking sniffable fuel, that is on the road north to Tennant Creek. So if, if we're rolling out opal fuel into Tennant Creek, it is vitally important that the whole region, the whole region has opal fuel, has non-sniffable fuel. Other, otherwise, you undermine, you undermine the rolling out of opal fuel into Tennant Creek. So it is critically important that the, for, the, for the success of the whole plan that these roadhouses that are continuing to, to stock sniffable fuel are identified and required to stock, to stock non-sniffable fuel, but also the next component of the plan will be undermined if this isn't dealt with now. So I urge the government to continue their good work on petrol sniffing and to ensure that this, does it, this solves the problem once and for all, you don't want to see such a good program undermined because some roadhouses are not are not doing the right thing and are not and are not stocking the non-sniffable opal fuel. Question is that the motion moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion?